God, we, uh, we come before you this morning and we just honor you. God, we love you so much. And God, I know that in a room this size, there are people walking into this place with difficulty, with heaviness, with loads on their back, God. And I pray this morning that as we gather, as we worship, as we hear your word proclaimed, God, I pray that you will meet us right where we're at. We don't have to come and be some pretend version of ourselves, God, but you meet us right where we're at. So God, that's my prayer this morning, that you will meet us, that we will experience your love, your mercy, your grace for us this morning, and that you'll speak powerfully to us through your word. So God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. 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 So how many of you saw the new Avengers movie, or any Avengers movie for that matter? So a good number of us. And if you know anything about the Marvel Universe, you know that there is like this period of time after a new Avengers movie comes out where spoilers are strictly prohibited, right? Where like if you, spo- like few things will get you hated by the world than spoiling an Avengers movie. I remember when Endgame come out, came out that weekend, there was a youth pastor that literally said on stage, Iron Man died, and his youth group hated him at that point. I... I probably just spoiled it for some of you. I'm, it's been out for what, two months? Okay. <laughs> he doesn't, just kidding. I, okay, moving on. <laughs> but have you ever wondered, when it comes to spoilers, where this whole, like, humanity thing is headed? Right? Like, we, we read the news, and we see stuff that's happening. And I can't help but wonder, man, like, like what is going to happen with this world, with the people here. I mean, we hear of mass shootings, it feels like, on the regular. We hear about abuse and disease and depression and despair and, I mean, some really heavy stuff. And I have found myself asking, man, where is this whole thing headed? And I'm going to give you a fair warning. I'm going to give you a pretty big spoiler alert on where things are headed this morning, um, as we find in Scripture. But it's been out for centuries, so if you haven't read it yet, that's that's kind of on you, I, I would say. But... We're going to, I just want to talk about where this whole humanity thing is headed. Because the Bible speaks really clearly about this, and it's going to lead us into our text today in Colossians. Uh, And so, you don't have to turn here, but Revelation 21, verses 3 through 7, this is in the message version. And I love the picture that John paints of where this whole humanity thing is headed. And so, if you want to put that text up there, it says this, look. Look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. There is people. He's their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears are gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. The enthroned continue. Look, I'm making everything new. Write it all down. Each word dependable and accurate. Then he said, it's happened. I'm A to Z. I'm the beginning. I'm the conclusion. From water of life, well, I give freely to the thirsty. Conquerors inherit all of this. I'll be God to them. They'll be sons and daughters to me. Now, Revelation paints this beautiful picture of a new humanity. And I know Revelation is one of those books where it's like super muddy and there's a lot of allegory and stuff like that happening in here. We're not going to dive into any of that today. What I want to focus in on is this picture of the new humanity that John paints in this book, where every tear is wiped from our eyes, where there is no more death, where there is no more grief. Other parts of Revelation talk about People from every tribe, every tongue, every nation gathered in the throne room around the person of Jesus on the throne. This is the new humanity. The new humanity where there is no more pain. There is no more grief. There is no more injustice or abuse or racial tensions. There's no more mass shootings. There's no more any of this stuff because it's all of us as one surrounding the person of Jesus forever and ever and ever. Amen? Come on, somebody. That's exciting. Now, the question I want to ask today as we dive into Paul's letter to the Colossians, as we continue this series road trip, is what if you could experience some of that new humanity right now? 
What if you could experience a glimpse of that thing to come where unity is perfect, where everything surrounds the person of Jesus right here and right now? This is what Paul writes to the Colossians. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to chapter 3, verse 1. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So Paul is writing this letter to the Colossians from prison. He's literally enchained while he's writing this letter. And he's never met these people. He's never visited before. He actually gets an update on this church from a guy who planted it. And he's writing to this group of Colossians. And if you imagine Colossae, it's kind of like a Wayland in some ways. It's not this big metropolis. It's not this big city. It's more of a small town. And it's full of these Christians, these people who genuinely desire to follow Jesus. But they're so new at this. And there's so many different things that are being thrown at them that they don't understand that they haven't navigated through yet. They're not Jewish Christians. They're Gentile Christians. And so what Paul is saying to them is he's saying, don't set your minds on things that are here and now. He says, set your mind on things above. Now, here's what Paul doesn't mean when he say, says that. And here's a common interpretation of this. Is he doesn't mean Jesus is going to come sweep us away from this wretched place, and so nothing you do here matters, and nobody around you matters, and because it's all going to be washed away eventually, and Jesus is going to sweep you up into the clouds, and everything's going to be good forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> He's not saying that. What Paul is saying to this church in Colossae is you see these things to come. They can be experienced here and now. That Jesus is already on the throne. Even if you may not fully see it yet, he is already on the throne. And you can experience glimpses of this new kind of humanity. This new way of existing in the world here and now. The gospel is not just good news for things to come. It is good news for us here and now. This is what Paul's saying to the Colossians. And so... If I were to sum up Paul's message to the Colossians in one kind of main thing, I mean, this is what he is challenging this church to do, if you want to throw that slide up there. He's saying this. He's saying, when you are in Christ, you see the world through the eyes of redemption. When you are in Christ, you see the world through the eyes of redemption. You no longer see the world as the world sees the world. Everything about your life has been reordered and re-understood. And so I want to illustrate this with you this morning. And so I'm going to invite my amazing, lovely wife up to the stage. And she's going to help me with this this morning. Did I ask you to cheer? No, I'm just kidding. Okay. So one thing you may not know about Sam and I is that we love to make smoothies. We are big smoothie people. Okay. So she's going to help me make a smoothie this morning. And so we're going to make, should we make a strawberry banana smoothie? Does that work? You put spinach in them, which is kind of gross. Ugh. <laughs> we're not going to put spinach in it this morning because I have the microphone. So, All right, so we're going to make a strawberry banana smoothie. And so to make this, we need strawberries, we need some yogurt, we need some milk. So if you want to start dumping those things in there in the proper proportions because you are an expert at this. So, nope, just... Just knock it on in there. <laughs> I'm obviously not an expert at this. So every good strawberry banana smoothie, it needs some, okay. needs some yogurt. Just, <laughs> yeah, just no nobody else is, okay. So you need some yogurt. Watch out, it's done. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> so you need some yogurt. Milk. Some milk. You need a few strawberries. There we go. We really like strawberries around here. Okay. Hmm, that's good. 
All right, we need some banana. All right. All right, you want to blend that? All right, this is not the one you have at home. All right, so go ahead and, and then you got to press. There we go. Oh, that looks good. All right, good enough. It works. Okay, so here we have this smoothie. And I would say what this represents is this group of people in Colossae that genuinely desire to follow Jesus really well. I mean, their desire is to follow him and to look like him, and they have a genuine desire to follow Jesus. But there's a problem, is that there are a lot of other influences coming at them, a lot of other voices. You see, if this represents seeing the world through the eyes of redemption, there's some other voices that are telling them how to see the world. For example, there is the voice of love of money. There's this worship of this God, Hermes, which is the love of money, the representation of money. And so we got some banana food, but it's baby food bananas. So we're going to just put a little bit of that in there. There we go. Yep. And then in there as well is worship of this God named Aphrodite, God of sex. So we're going to put a little dog treats in there as well. Oh, it's going to get worse. We got the worship of Apollo and Midas, self-indulgence, music, culture. There's these really strict household codes, which were built around the writings of people like Aristotle and Plato, that said the man is the unquestioned head of the household, and everybody below the man acts as almost a servant or patron-client relationship. That households weren't built on love, they were built on duty. They were built on the need to perform. And so there was a lot of abuse happening. So we got some chicken nuggets to represent that. And so, some chicken nuggets. What? Why would I waste chicken? They're cold and from last night, so I'm not sure you want, they're probably still fine, but. Okay, so you got that. You also have massive amounts of slavery happening in Colossae. It's estimated that one in every three people is enslaved in Colossae. And the closer you get to Rome, it becomes one in every two people. Rich families and poor families had slaves. There was, it was common for parents to sell their kids, poor families to sell their kids into sex slavery for life. I mean, this was... And slaves were not viewed as fully human. They were dehumanized. So we got some fish food to represent that. It's a lot of fish. That would kill a fish real quick. And so there's other influences. Racial inequality. Classist divisions. There's Jewish influences coming at them, telling them how they should obey the law, what parts of the law they should obey. There's religious expectations. There's all of this different stuff that's just influencing Colossae. And so you have this group of people that genuinely want to follow Jesus. But their lives... Their lives might look a lot more like this, where they're not seeing the world through the eyes of redemption, but they're seeing the world through their culture, through the art around them, through all of these different influences, some of which are genuinely not bad influences. Some of them are good, but what happens is Jesus is just kind of this equal for them among other influences, that he's just one good influence among many. Does anybody want a drink of this? at all? <laughs> One person raises their hands. I, when I was a student pastor, they played a game and they made me drink something like this. I'm not going to be that cruel and unusual with punishment, but the point of this, the point of this is this, that my fear is that the church, Christianity in America, looks a lot like this. 
where Jesus might be this nice guy, he might be this nice idea, he might be one influence among many, but also in the voices of how Christians see the world is through the lens of social media, through the lens of the news media, through all of these different lenses. And what happens is we're not seeing the world through the eyes of redemption. We're seeing the world through the eyes of our culture. We're seeing the world through the eyes of brokenness. We're seeing the world through the eyes of lostness. And the reason Paul writes this letter is he says, reorder your lives around who Jesus is and what he has done for you, that you are no longer dead people walking. You are alive in Christ. He is master. He is Lord. He is not just one influence among many. He is over and above everything. And so, I wonder, where are we at right now with this? I mean, because here's the thing. He's not recognizable when our lives look like this. He's not recognizable to the world. We're having the same conversations as the world. We're having the same debates, the same dialogues. We're viewing the same people the same way that the world is telling us to view people. And Jesus ends up being unrecognizable. So I want to just ask some questions this morning. Are we more interested in self-preservation or lifting people up? Is the church a beacon of racial reconciliation and unity in our world, or do we look like the rest of the world? Is the way we talk to and about others different? Do you hear more gossip coming out of the church or out of your workplace? Are we more motivated by love or fear of people who look different than us? Do we worship image and money and power, or do we love people? I think these are some of the questions that we need to wrestle with because Paul dives deep into each one of these relationships. According to Paul, this metaphorical blender should not exist with someone who has been raised in Christ. That Jesus isn't just one influence among a lot of other equals, but Jesus is the influence in our lives. He, He influences and he gives us perspective on how we see people, how we treat people, how we talk to people. And it needs to look different than the world. Moving on in Colossians here, in chapter 3, verse 5, Paul says this to the church in Colossae. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Listen to this last verse. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. When you are in Christ, you see the world through the eyes of redemption. You see people through the eyes of redemption. So Paul then goes and he gets pretty specific and he reorders how each and every one of our relationships in the world should look because of this. He actually defines what your relationships towards other people, what your perspective towards other people should look like when you are in Christ. I I brought a list here of some of the ones that he goes through. First, he talks to husbands and wives. Chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, he says, wives, submit to your husbands. This would have been very familiar language for people living in this world. Wives, submit to your husbands. But then he says, husbands, love your wives. Well, that would have been different because households weren't built on love. They were built on duty. Next one. He says he reorders the relationship, if you want to throw up that next one there, of parents and kids. He redefines what parent and children relationship looks like. He builds them around love, and he says, if you are in Christ, this is what your relationships as parents and as kids should look like. In verses 20 and 21, 
He says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Again, this isn't all about duty and service to the head of the household. This is about love. Households built around love. If you want to go to the next one there, he reorders slaves and masters relationships. His message to slaves and masters is that slaves have humanity in Christ. That, that when the world dehumanizes and when the world sees people as less than fully human, Paul says, no, slaves, even your master has a master. And his name is Jesus. And so he reorders how slavery works in this world. And he says, slaves, submit to your masters. He's not condoning slavery. He's acknowledging the reality of the day. But he says, submit to your masters. Masters, treat your slaves well because you are both in Christ. Next one, different races. Paul addresses racism head on in this passage. And the amount of time that racism is devoted to in the New Testament is astounding. And yet for so many of us, it's not something we want to navigate into and it's not something we want to talk about because it's uncomfortable and it's painful and we get defensive. But when we're in Christ, we are called to step into some of the most broken places and speak into those things. So Paul actually kind of destroys the notion of racism in, in verse 11. And he says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, which were some incredibly deep cultural divides. Those two groups hated each other, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. And then he gets specific. And he talks to specific people in the church in Colossae. A guy named Philemon. Has anybody heard of Philemon? There's a book of the Bible named after him. Philemon was a Christian living in Colossae who had a slave. A slave named Onesimus. You can read all about this story in the book of Philemon. But Onesimus escapes from Colossae, heads to Rome, meets Paul in Rome, is converted, he trusts in Jesus, and then Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon and says, this guy isn't your slave anymore, he's your brother. See him through the eyes of redemption now. Don't see him through the eyes of the world. See him through the eyes of transformation, of redemption, of what Jesus has done in both of your lives. Do you believe that Jesus is powerful enough to reconcile and restore even the most broken of relationships in our world? We believe that. Because the Bible, Jesus did this too, and Paul did this all the time, has this tendency to go after the most controversial, the deepest divides in humanity. And says the power of Jesus has the power to reconcile even those most broken of things in our world. And so I want to invite us to do a little self-inventory this morning. And... Uh, I realize that I'm navigating into this a little bit. Uh, toss that fish food away back there. <laughs> yeah, so gross, I'm going to gag. Um, so I want to just ask you a question. I'm going to go through just some different groups of people. And I want to ask you this question. Are you seeing even the deepest divides in our culture today through the eyes of redemption? Or are you seeing these divides through the eyes of the world? So I'm going to list off some names and some groups of people, and I want you just to write down the very first word that comes to mind. Be brutally honest. There's no judgment here. Not all of these will apply to everyone, but I want us to just do a little self-inventory, and I've had to do this myself as I've navigated through this text this week. Let's start with an easy one. You're going to write down the first word that comes to mind. It's a word association game. The first one is Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, who comes, what comes to your mind right away when you hear that name? Mother Teresa. All right, don't answer this next one out loud. Write it down. Your spouse. Do you see your spouse through the eyes of redemption, or do you see your spouse through the eyes of the world? Your ex-spouse, if you have one. Do you see your ex-spouse through the eyes of the world or through the eyes of redemption? Here, oh, this one's, this one's brutal. People that merge at the last minute in construction zones. 
Here's a worse one. People who say they're right when they do that. What about this one? People of a different skin color than you. People of a different skin color than you. Let's make this even more difficult and personal. People of a different skin color kneeling during the anthem. Do you see them through the eyes of redemption with compassion or do you see them through the eyes of this world with outrage and anger? The veterans who have sacrificed so much for freedom. Your boss at work. Your boss at work. The person in the grocery store not speaking English. Your neighbor who blares their music way too dang loud at night. The people who wrote Old Town Road, that godforsaken song <laughs> that I feel like I have to like now that I live in Wayland. <laughs> LGBT people. Are you seeing them through the eyes of redemption or are you seeing them through the eyes of this world? Your overly religious family member. The judgy Christian. The reason I go through this list is not to get political. I actually don't believe that um, my job is to ever advocate for any specific policy or anything like that, but it's to ask the question, are we having the same conversation in the church that the world is having about different groups of people? Is our social media feed, is the news media influencing how we see the humanity in other people before this does. I had heard it said when I first got into ministry that you will never be able to do ministry for people that you view as below you. You will never be able to minister to people that you view are below you. I, I've told this before, but I have uh, three kids, and my oldest, her name is Emery. And Emery's a little firecracker, spitball three-year-old, and... Uh, she, uh, she's teaching me a lot about this right now. One of the groups of people that I didn't mention yet is the homeless person standing on the street. What is a word that comes to mind when you see the homeless person on the side of the street? If I'm being totally honest with you, mine is look away. Don't put yourself in an uncomfortable position. Don't see those people through the eyes of redemption. Emery is teaching me to see that differently. We drive down 131 a lot to get down here these days, and there's, um, there's a guy that stands pretty consistently at the intersection of Wealthy and 131 South. His name is Charlie. And my wife, Sam, and Emery have driven by Charlie a number of times, and where we as adults often want to kind of look away and look down, Emery is like, who's that? <laughs> and Sam was like, well, that's Charlie. And she's like, why is he standing there? And uh, she's like, well, I, I think he wants some money. And Emery's like, well, can we give him some money? <laughs> Sam's like, sure. So they give him some money and kind of drive on and go on with their day. And now every single time that we drive by the intersection, Emery is looking for Charlie. She's not looking for the homeless person. She's not looking for somebody that we might call a freeloader or desperate or any kind of word that we might use to view them through the eyes of the world, Emery only sees her friend Charlie. So much so that she has made us stop, get out of the car, and take pictures with her friend Charlie so she can give him a hug. I mean, this is like, this is how purely this little three-year-old sees this guy. The question I want to ask again is, are you seeing people through the eyes of redemption? Because here's the reality, is that you will never encounter a person, ever, for whom Jesus did not die. You will never encounter a person in your life for whom Jesus did not deem worthy of laying down his life for. Ever. Ever. I, uh, have been learning this really the hard way over the last several years, and Sam can speak to this too, but 
many of you guys know that we, we've been foster parents for the last six or seven years, and we've had a lot of kids in our home. And uh, several of those kids have been African American. And uh, I had a very specific perspective on race before ever having kids live in our home. And so we'd navigate the world, and they'd come into our home, and it would be the type of thing where they would kind of assimilate to the way that we did life. And so we'd put them in uh, Rockford schools, which was nearly 100% white, and we'd buy them clothes and all of these different things. One of the little girl's names was Octavia that came to live with us. And Octavia was amazing. I mean, you know that show, Kids Say the Darndest Things? I feel like this girl could be on that show over and over again. She just said some of the craziest stuff. It was amazing. But there were some things that I experienced with Octavia that have forever influenced how I view reconciliation and race. See, I think Octavia has challenged me to see people through the eyes of redemption more than anybody else that I've encountered. At one point, Octavia looked at Sam and I and she said, when I grow up, I want to be white because white is better. When we walked by police officers, she would cling to us out of fear. So many things about her experience looked so different than mine. And what often happens is we hear those things and we just want to put up defenses. And we run and run away as fast and as hard as we can. But the gospel requires that we actually move towards that brokenness. Because we believe in a Jesus who is powerful enough to heal and reconcile even the deepest of divisions. Going back to Revelation 21, that there will come a time and a place where everyone is gathered around the throne room of Jesus. That there is no more division like this. That there is no more infighting. There is no more racial division. There is no more need to lash out at each other. There is no more need to have outrage towards each other. And what Paul is saying is, you as the church need to be a glimpse of the new humanity here and now. In the way that you see people, in the way that you interact with people, in the way that you pursue people. So I want to close with this verse from Colossians here. Chapter 1, verse 18 to 21. It says this, and this is from the message once again. He, Jesus, was supreme in the beginning and leading the resurrection parade. He is supreme in the end. From beginning to end, he's there, towering far above everything, everyone. So spacious is he, so roomy that everything of God finds its proper place in him without crowding. Not only that, but all the broken and distorted pieces of the universe... People and things, animals and atoms get properly fixed and fit together in vibrant harmonies all because of his death, his blood that poured down from the cross. And then listen to what it says next. You yourselves are a case study of what he does. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so as we close today, I just want to ask that question once again. Do I believe that Jesus has the power to restore even the most deep human divisions? Because if I don't, the good news of the gospel isn't very good news. And so I want to think about the people sitting in this room, this community here and now. And think about all the different types of people that we have sitting in this room right now. We have people who were here, are here for the first time this morning. We have people sitting here who were at New Life at the very first week, the very start of this community. We have people who grew up in church sitting in this room and people who still don't believe in Jesus. We have people who look different from each other. We have people who are loud, people who are quiet. We have people who love coffee and people who are wrong. We have 
people who have recently given birth and people who are recently mourning loss. We have newly married people in this room, newly divorced people in this room. There are so many reasons for us to find to be divided. So many. But there is one reason. One reason for us to be united and to pursue reconciliation with the world. And that one reason is Jesus himself. That his laying down of his life actually has the power to heal all things about our lives. There's nothing off limits. There's no relationship that's too broken that he cannot bring some sort of reconciliation and healing to. Now, I want you to to hear this, that maybe for some of you, this looks like simply the statement, I forgive you. If you've been abused or hurt in the past, hear this from me, that this message is not for you to put yourself in a position to be abused and hurt once again. That That would be a misapplication of Paul's words and of this message. But for some of you, you are holding on to such bitterness and resentment and anger in your heart towards a person that has hurt you that for you, this played out simply just means, I forgive you. I'm willing to let this go. For the others of you, this is a matter of writing down a name of a person that you have avoided for far too long and maybe inviting them to this community, to this church. For others of you, this is a statement saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. It's going first. For others of us, this is, I will listen to you before I will speak at you. And I get an amen to that one. I feel like (laughs) some of us, myself included, need to be more quick to listen before we speak at people. For others of us, it's I will assume the best about you. I will inconvenience myself for you. I will change the way I speak about you. Friends, we need to be having a different conversation about some of these difficult, difficult issues than the world is having. And too often we are so caught up in the conversations the world is having that our lives look like this and we lose our testimony for Jesus himself. So I want to encourage you that as Paul says to the Colossians, Make Jesus Lord of your life. Make him Lord of your life in the way that you speak to each other. Make him Lord of the light of your life in the way that you view other people, people that are different than you, people that have different experiences than you. And as a result of that, reach out and pursue them in the name of Jesus. So I would love to pray for us today as we close. And then Brandon, Alberta, a different Brandon this morning, is going to come up and, and close us out for the morning. So let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for your power in our lives. Jesus, we thank you that we know where this story is headed. That the end of the story is that there is no end of the story. That Jesus, we are headed towards forever and always worshiping you. Where people from every different group, every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every language is gathered around you worshiping you forever and ever. And so, God, may we be a preview of that here and now in the way that we love people, in the way that we speak about people, in the way that we reach out to people. Jesus, thank you for the fact that you don't call us to just stay where we're at, but you call us into more. We desire to follow you into that. And so we love you, we praise you, we honor you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen.